Welcome to Scoreography, a podcast about the greatest sport on ice, figure skating. I'm Wendy Buskey. And I'm Adrian Buskey. And we are here to talk about the Grand Prix Final 2023. Oh this is our recap and commentary episode on it. If you listened to our previous episode, it was a preview where we talked about what we were expecting from this event. We made some of our own predictions. We'll be talking a little <laughs> bit about how incredibly <laughs> off those ended up being. Uh, it depends on which discipline. Yeah. But before we dig into all that, I do just want to address the fact that we had a big influx of new listeners with the last couple of episodes. And a lot of you have been giving us these really great comments like on YouTube and we've gotten some nice emails and stuff too. And I just really want to take a second to thank everybody who's joined the show and said some kind words, have engaged with us and with some of your other listeners in the comment section. All of that is really, really awesome. We love getting that feedback. We love getting that exchange of ideas and responses to these things. So thank you so much for coming on board with us. And please continue to, to uh, communicate with us like that. We it's love it. It's genuinely been kind of overwhelming. And I'm really, really, really grateful. Skating is something that I've loved since I was four years old. Pretty much as long as I can remember is how long I've loved skating. So getting a response like this is very heartwarming and it's extremely appreciated. It's also, I think, when you've got a sport that sometimes feels very niche, yeah. um, you can feel like us where you're kind of an island where not a lot of your like close personal friends are a big fan of the sport. So actually having more people to share the love of it together is really, really heartwarming and really okay. fun. So again... Thanks to everybody who has joined us and maybe is hearing us for the first time with this episode. Welcome on board. And I hope you love what we do and that I hope you love skating as much as we do and that we convey that with everything that we talk about here. Yes. And I hope everyone was able to actually watch the Grand Prix final. And if not, they can find it somewhere online because it was an experience. Yeah, this is a pretty fascinating event because on one level... You had some really powerhouse performances, including some really interesting firsts, historic. Uh, historic things on the Grand Prix. You had some really surprising cases of people falling apart that you would have never seen it coming from. And certainly some podium placements that are right in line with our, our expectations and other ones that wildly fell outside of what we thought was going to happen. I really want to start with the men, because if we're talking about historic, that's the place to start with Ilya Malinin. Right. With Ilya Malinin, he threw a quad axle in the short program. In the preview episode, we talked a lot about the group of men going to this Grand Prix final had a lot of firepower. When you have Ilya Malinin, Shoma Uno, Yuma Kagiyama, Adam Salim Fa, Cal Mira, and Kevin Amos, you have people who are running a spectrum between incredible artistry to incredible technical jumping ability, and then some people who ride right in that middle as fully complete skaters who can do it all. Ilya is not quite at that complete skater mark yet. No, not at all. And we've <laughs> talked a lot about his growth over the season. We did see him kind of slide more towards that technical end at this performance, I think, because he knew that to be competitive with these guys, Yes, he needs that artistry, but he was going to have to lean hard on the fact that nobody jumps like he does. And that's what he did here. Exactly. I want to be specific. He was extraordinary here and his artistry has come quite a long way. And just this season, we've seen a lot of growth and development there. But at the Grand Prix final, it was an expectation that he was going to throw down everything he could. And my goodness, did he ever not only did he land the quad axle in the short program, which was the first time anyone has done that, which alone is a huge milestone and catapulted him to the top after the short program. But in the long program, while the quad axle was the one element that failed him, he did do a quad loop, which he has never done in international competition, which makes him the only person to have ever landed all of the quads, all six of those quads. Ilya Malinin is the only person to have ever done that. And he got both of those milestones at this competition. Right. And he does come in first here very, very solidly. After the uh, the short program, he was only in first place by a shred. And one of the things that we talked about in our preview episode was we expected him to use the quad axle at this event. And we got some uh, division about that in the comments. Understandably. Yeah. yeah, because there was a lot of talk about 
just whether or not he would throw things like that at this point in the season, because, you know, we're only basically like halfway through the season at this point and whether or not he would want to be putting those impacts on his body or taking those risks with it. But we really figured that Illy has shown that he and his his coaching team, his parents have been really good about looking at the numbers and saying, OK, what do we need to do to maximize your ability to stay on top of the podium here? And the quad axle, while it does still feel like it's a bit of an underscored element, it does give him just a little bit of an edge when he can land it. Yes, exactly. And I'm really curious to see where he goes after this. Like my expectation is that at some point in the second half of the season, he's going to want to land every quad in the same program if he can. I also know there's been rumblings that he's looking at the quad axle in combination. I don't know if there is a ceiling yet for him. We're going to find out. But his jumping ability is just unbelievable. The thing that I was hearing ahead of this was that he was actually going to the judges and asking, is it allowable for me to, the do, short, yeah, yeah. to do the quad axle? The short program has very strict limitations on what you can and cannot do. And so typically what you see is one triple or quad single jump, a triple axle and a jump in combination, which is usually a triple triple or a triple double or a quad triple. Right. So what we saw Ilya do here is that he started the program with a quad axle and an amazing one. It was yeah, absolutely it was gorgeous. And then he did a quad Lutz triple toe, which was just massive, just a huge, huge jump. And then he threw a triple axle. So I would have thought that the quad axle would have filled that axle necessity. Yeah. yeah. But it seems like he talked to them and they said, no, you have to have a triple axle because by the rules, by the book, yeah. a triple axle must be in there. My guess is that they said, you know what, as long as you throw that triple axle, then you have the allowance to do a quad axle as a different jump in there. It seems like a weird choice. But it worked and, and it, it was great. <laughs> and it was it's worth looking at the fact that when you watched it in the live feed and you saw the scoring at the top, when he threw that first jump with the quad axle, it didn't have a score. It for was a invalid long time. at first. They considered it invalid at first and then it changed to being valid. However, I think there was one judge, I think it was the Belgian judge that actually gave him like a negative five GOE and then maybe never changed it because of the original qualifier of invalid and then they switched it to being that i don't know it was just weird regardless it landed him in first going into the free and then he did try it again in the free and it looked good going in but then it sort of started to go off axis in the air but at the same time i almost feel like it fueled his fire for the rest of the program because from that point on i didn't see an error it was just absolutely spectacular and that quad loop for being the first time that he's ever thrown that in competition it could not have looked less uncomfortable it was just one of those like this looks like he's breathing yeah. moments. i want to point out that at the end of the short program Ilya with that quad axle did achieve a season's best mm -hmm. um he had a 106.90 and that just put him just a shade above shoma in second place who had a 106.02 that quad axle made the difference for him in the short in, in the short to just get ahead of Shoma. Didn't really give him much in the way of padding, but it got him into that first position. So um, strategically, that move paid off. And even though he didn't land it in the long program, like you said, the firepower that he had with the rest of the technical was really impressive. I do think that that succession program, which I love and I gosh, I love the music selection so much. I do think that it's artistry the pcs element of it was slightly more rudimentary than what we've seen him do earlier in the season Agreed. i think he's been stronger artistically mm -hmm. and i think that you know when you compare the, the all the performers that were leading right up to him when you look at people like adam Saumfa and uh, shoma uno and yuma kagiyama you're gonna see this greater level of artistry and so it, you'll be able to tell the difference but beyond that, just the technical ability of what he was putting in and the level of artistry that he was going for was very effective in this competition and led him into the podium spot. He actually, with that entire program and the short combined, ended up with a season's best overall score of 314. So massive score, really kind of untouchable at this point whenever he's that good. But I agree with you what you're saying about the artistry, and I know I have a bias, 
I don't think anybody's better as an all around performer than Shoma Uno right now in the men's discipline. Him coming in second here, there's a part of me that was a little bummed because I just love him so much, but also it felt appropriate. I mean, I don't think that there's any question that Ilya just owned this competition, but artistically, there's no touching Shoma. It's just really, really beautiful skating. And the only person who came close was Kevin Amos in the short, but Shoma just shined. And while his technical was nowhere near what Ilya's was, it was nothing to scoff at. He still ended up with a 298, his own season's best so far, and was extraordinary. I do feel like with Shoma at this one, that we saw him put a little bit more of the focus into his technical. You know, we've only seen Shoma on a few outings because he's really just been on the Grand Prix. He wasn't skating in the earlier part of the season. And we've seen him deliver just absolutely gorgeous artistic skates. But it had kind of looked like he wasn't spending as much of his energy in the jumps necessarily. I think going into this competition, there was the awareness that he, if he wanted a real podium spot against the firepower that this men's group had. He was going to have to put a little bit more effort into that. And he did it very, very effectively. His jumps looked spectacular. I think that in his his long program, almost all of his jumps were somewhere between like 2.5 and 2.8 GOEs, like very, very strong. But he did have, again, the killed by the Q problem of three quarter turn rotation under rotation calls, which definitely lost him a little bit. Not much. I mean, that's it's fairly minor. But whenever it adds up, then it's a problem. And the judges are calling him on it a lot. I agree with what you said there, though. The one problem he had had in the long program was with his triple axle and he popped it. But then at the end, he threw the triple axle back in because like, what the heck? Why not? It was great to see that fight come back in him. And I'm like, oh, I love this. His short program was poetry. I was mesmerized. I didn't even notice the jumps didn't matter. It was just absolutely perfectly gorgeous. There was something that uh, Mark, the commentator, had said that I was really taken with, which was that after NHK, Yuma Kagiyama had made the comment that Shoma is his idol. Shoma apparently was just like, well, I have to skate up to being his idol. It's just so cute. I just love them both. And I'm so happy to see them both here. <laughs> Speaking of Yuma Kagiyama, the second Japanese skater in this Grand Prix final landed in the bronze position on the podium. We've been so, so happy to get Yuma back this season yeah, because, know. you know, we were missing him last season because of injury. You know, we know that he's still not at his entire arsenal of quad jumps yet because mm -hmm. he is still coming back from that injury and it's been taking us time. But what I think that we've really seen is him become an even more complete artistic skater. Yeah, absolutely. His grace on the ice, his musicality, the way that he invests himself in these programs, you know, seeing Carolina Costner as one of his coaches alongside his father, you're seeing her impact on that as well. It's just really, really beautiful. I love his short program, the Imagine Dragons Believer program, especially really like his outfit. Like there's something about those metal studs on. I just think are pretty badass. And like, oh my gosh, his quad sal in the short program. Right. The long, it was like he got jinxed by the commentator. The commentator's like, watch how perfect this is going to be. And then womp, womp, it was a double. Yeah. <laughs> but much of the rest of his program was exceptional. He did land in fourth in the free, but he was in third in the short and had enough of a lead that it didn't matter. And he stayed in bronze position. And I do have to say it was not only remarkable to see him here and so thrilling to have him on the podium, but also all season it's been noted like his Long program footwork sequence at the end is just one of the best easily of the season, but just in general, it's exceptionally good. And this, even though this was not as clean as he was at NHK, I think it was better. I feel like he had fire and passion and like emotion in a way I haven't really seen from Yuma before. Like he's such a beautiful skater, but sometimes he just sort of lacks that extra something that makes you feel and that was all over his long program. It was just so nice to see that evolution. I think the thing with Yuma is that we're seeing this greater maturity in his skating and the way his presentation works. I think that in the past, it was a little hard to separate the performance from the fact that he is this small, smiley, just like adorable, just a very, yeah, he has this adorable energy to him. And when you see him off the ice, it's he and his father are so cute together and 
I think sometimes when you have somebody like that, that's sort of diminutive in stature out there, you know, skating to like huge, big, dramatic music, it can overwhelm them. At this point now, Yuma has taken control of that. Yeah. He has his hands around the music. He has his full presence in it. And you just see an artist on ice and a technician and it's really working. And I think that the growth just over the course of this Grand Prix has really, really shown how far Yuma has come and how far he can go. I agree. And in fourth, I mean, leading into that, I feel like you just led up to it. And this kind of goes to our uh, comments that our picks beforehand weren't exactly on point. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> um, Adam Siohim Fa, who I feel like really only lost the podium spot by one jump. And that was in his short program. He opened up on his quad Lutz, turned it into a double. And unfortunately, that just counts as an empty element. It doesn't exist. So it's a lot of points to lose and put him in really a position where unless there was a big failure on someone's part, he wasn't going to make it back to the podium. That said, he had a gorgeous free skate, like a couple of rough patches, but nothing major. Overall, it was a huge redemptive skate and a reminder that he is that good. And he is absolutely in the conversation for a, a podium spot at Worlds. There was no massive failure or to use uh, Adrian's favorite phrase, he didn't shit the bed. Um, <laughs> he he definitely did not. He was fantastic in that free program and seeing him thrive and come back and have the composure to not hold over that disappointment from one day to the next. It made me feel even more secure in where he's going to go the rest of the season and beyond. Well, the old adage is you can't win a competition with the short program, but you can definitely lose it. And unfortunately, seeing Adam go out there and lose that whole element and drop into sixth where he was my favorite person to win. I mean, he had come Many into this. Peoples, yeah. yeah, he'd come into this undefeated through this season. He'd won every competition he was in. He'd been so consistent. He was just remarkable all through this season. And then you get into that short program and you see one element just go wrong and that drops him to the bottom. Now, we've seen some crazy rises this season, right? You know, oh, yeah. we've seen people jump from 11th to the podium or from fifth to first. But that didn't feel very likely here, considering the group of men who were in this competition. What we did see him is go from the sixth place to the fourth place and to get a very redemptive free skate. Like you said, it was kind of scratchy. It did have a few problems. But he was third in the free. It's yeah. not nothing. That's really worth him holding on to as he goes into the French nationals coming up and then Europeans beyond that. Yeah. And if you want something for the highlight reel from this, it's his Arabian. It's always his Arabian. It's always his Arabian is always one of the most standout elements that are in his program. But I don't think he's ever thrown a better one than what we saw in his free skate here. And the distance and height he gets on that is extraordinary. It's so good. And I love when you hear the crowd respond with like, oh, <laughs> yeah, it's a stellar, stellar <laughs> element. And then in fifth place, we saw the third Japanese competitor, Cal Mura. This is kind of where we sort of thought Cal would land in this competition, but he's always a threat because he is a really, really powerful competitor. Unfortunately, it seems like he was ill at this competition, particularly when we saw him in the free skate where it looked like he could barely keep on his feet. That was a little scary, actually. Him coming, he fought so hard through that whole program and you could see that he was uncomfortable, but he was still making that program as much of a powerful, complete program as he could. But every jump was just kind of off. I don't know if he actually fell. He just never quite had his footing. And at the end... After his closing position, he just sort of toppled a couple of times. And it just, I was genuinely he wobbled. Yeah. He definitely looked like he could have just lost his balance yeah. entirely. Like his whole equilibrium was off. Yeah. He just did not look okay. And then the kiss and cry at one point, he just looked like he was doubled over. I saw commentary on it later that he had said that he was dealing with a stomach virus, which I can't imagine doing what he did with a stomach bug. That's awful. So, I mean, massive kudos to him for being an incredible fighter. I know that competition in, was hugely important to him. But beyond that, going into Japanese nationals, having really shown up and said, I'm going to fight through this, 
Not that personally, I always think that uh, fighting through being ill is the right call, but I understand why he did it and good for him. Really, really commendable. But man, he, I was a little worried about him once it was done. I was. And then in sixth, I almost don't want to talk about him. I love him so much. <laughs> Kevin Amos, he had a rough one, as I guess what you would call it. His short program, extraordinary. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely gorgeous. He had one like step out on a jump, but was still easily, other than Shoma, the class of the field in terms of his artistry. The commentators even made repeated mentions of how good he was compared to everybody else. He was just exceptional. His free program started off okay. I wouldn't say amazing, but it started off okay. And his Bolero has been a thrilling program throughout the season. And then the first fall came, and I was worried that he had actually hit his face. Thankfully, when you saw it in slow-mo, he didn't, but it was a hard fall. And then right afterwards, he had his next jump, and it was just as bad of a fall. And from that point on, you could tell that there was no recovery. One of the crazy things about this sport is that you have to be able to go out there and take a really, really hard impact and then get right up and keep going and do more jumps. I think about if I fell that hard, and then granted, I'm not a professional athlete, but if I toppled like that, I'd be like, okay, I'm going to go sit down for the next hour because like... Or day. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because, I mean, that's brutal. That second fall was almost worse, and he went into the boards, and he just looked shaken afterwards. And it wasn't until he got to the footwork sequence at the end of it where he becomes the bull where you could see him marshal up all of his energy and bring and his in anger. And his anger and really channel that into something powerful right at the very end. But the rest of it was pretty hard to watch. It was really rough. And I was impressed with his composure coming off of the ice, especially yeah. knowing how much of an emotional person Kevin is. It was hard and heartbreaking to see for somebody who is as extraordinarily talented as he is. I mean, he got to the Grand Prix final for a reason. He absolutely deserves to be on that list of the top six men in the world. It's just hard whenever you have that bad of a day at the wrong time. And I send my heart to him and I hope that uh, by the time he gets to French Nationals in just, I think, a few days, unfortunately, I think it's this coming weekend, I hope that he can shake this off pretty quickly and know that it was an anomaly. Things happen, but mostly I was just happy that he stood up after those falls because yes. they looked really, really hard. So all of our love to Kevin Amos because he is a brilliant skater, a brilliant storyteller on ice. But overall, when you step aside from some of the challenges he had and, and the difficulties that we saw from Cow and Adam at various places in this competition, this was still really, really strong high level skating with some just absolute pyrotechnics from both the artistry and the technical stuff. So I thought it was really awesome. It was. It was really all it was expected to be, which was kind of the premier event of the whole competition. But I do want to talk about the uh, other premier event of this competition going into dance, because those six teams here, it was a little dicey coming in as to like where things were going to shake out. but. Overall, other than some really kind of fluky mistakes in the the short program, if that's a word, I'm going with fluky, why not? <laughs> it was really awesome to see, especially the top three teams that we'll talk about really show up in a big, big way to even change my mind, Piper Gillis and Paul Poirier with that short program. I'm now a fan of it. I finally have given in. I get it now. But it was really, really good. Leading up to this in the Grand Prix season so far, what we've kind of seen is some wild swings. We saw, you know, at Skate Canada where some of the numbers felt really blown out, where we saw Chalk and Bates felt maybe even a little underscored for stuff that they were doing in previous competitions, even when they were winning. That, frankly, for a lot of people, alarming result from <laughs> NHK when you saw Fear and Gibson beat Grenard and Fabry which uh, there was definitely in our comment section debate, debate about that. <laughs> I, there was a couple of people even said that they would fund the return of Gabby and Guillaume <laughs> if they saw Fear and Gibson win a Grand Prix final because they were like, we would have to bring back somebody to stop them. 
uh, which I thought was hilarious. I mean, I'm not going to say that we weren't talking about Gabby and Guillaume coming back earlier <laughs> this week as well. There's We have no insight or intel. We're just kind of crossing our fingers. <laughs> At least I am. You're crossing your fingers. I actually don't want to see Gabby and Guillaume come back. And I love them. I'm not saying anything against them. Uh, But that's a whole other conversation. (laughs) Uh, I think that going into this, you know, what you had was what we thought was like Chalk and Bates as the clear favorite. And they did win the podium here. They won gold. Finally. Um, Finally. After like, what, seven Grand Prix finals? Seven Grand Prix finals, four silver medals. Now they have a gold. So they have finally marked that achievement off. And it was very well deserved because they were spectacular here. They especially seeing a competition that was kind of marred by a lot of peculiar mistakes. Seeing them come out with total confidence and total dominance was really, really nice to see. Not for a second did you feel any doubt from either of them. The rhythm dance was actually kind of weird here because you saw a lot of small kind of weird mistakes, a lot of twizzle problems and stuff from some of the first teams out. But yeah, by the time you got through the leaders, the people who took the podium, those things cleared up in a big way. But what Chalk and Bates delivered here was exactly the promise of what they've been giving us this whole season to really dynamic, really complicated, really interesting, unique programs full of amazing stuff. And they even tweaked and altered little bits of attitude in them, like the queen rhythm dance. There's just elements of it that they just put a little extra zhuzh on in interesting ways. <laughs> like um, his facial hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, facial hair on Evan is a little weird. But I was thinking more about I'm how the, there's this little kick sequence thing they do in the middle of it that oh, um, yeah. is Her the, iconic little kicks. They're so, so sexy. <laughs> yeah. She does them so well. <laughs> and she just vamped different on them this time in a way that I think just obviously won the crowd and, and uh, sold really well on screen. But yeah, I don't know what to say about Chalk and Bates of this other than it's everything that we were expecting through the whole season just leveled up just a little bit more. They got an outstanding score at the end of it. They won definitively. Top score of the season now. Yes, they won definitively. There was no question that they were way on top there. It's exactly what we expected from them. Yes. But we didn't know how the scoring would go with this. Exactly. I mean, and with them, you never really do know what the scoring is going to be because some people like their style. And I mean, they're a very divisive team for all that we know that they are exceptional Not everybody loves their avant-garde kind of nature, and I am very, very glad to see it rewarded here. But in kind of a more traditional, even though they can be avant-garde as well, I thought Guinard and Fabri's long program, which is a lot more of your romantic, deep need, traditional ice dance, it was the most refined, perfect version of this program that I've seen them do. And it was mesmerizing. I was really, really pleased to see the Italian team make their way to the silver because having just you know, lost to Fear and Gibson. They came here with fire. Yes, they obviously had something to prove because that was not the position they expected to be in after an HK. And they came in here with even more poise and focus Their musicality was really, really on point here. The balance of the way that team works as far as like dynamic movement with artistic expression and connection. Yes. And connection. A team that really feels almost like one body on the ice at times. Beautiful twizzle sequences. I was thrilled with it. I really, really enjoyed their free skate in particular. I agree with you. You know how I feel about their short. I just don't love it. But there's no arguing how good they were in both programs. I am always just so impressed with them technically, but the more I watch them as a team, I'm just so impressed with Marco. Like she is fantastic, but his level of ability is just one of those things where sometimes he does something and I'm just like, that's ridiculous. How did you even just do that? You small, brilliant man. (laughs) It's just, I don't know what it is, but he just impresses me more and more. So I agree. I was, thrilled for them and it was a great bit of redemption after nhk as well but it also was cool to see them come in and obviously have the we don't like this and we're gonna fix it type of vibe everything about them radiated that whereas in a different kind of i don't know more gentle sensibility is how i felt about gillis and poirier here everything about them at this competition felt warm and inviting and prepared and While they came in third, no part of that felt like it necessarily mattered to them. They knew that they had put out really beautiful skates 
And as I've said on previous episodes, I haven't really been a fan of these programs as much as I am a fan of theirs. The short program has won me over here because I felt all their feelings in it. Yeah. It felt like they were so present that I couldn't help but get swept up in it. I think the Withering Heights program, more and more I'm realizing I'm just not a fan of the music and that's what's losing me. But regardless, they had some of the most beautiful lifts I've seen in ice dance in this program. They're just gorgeous. Yeah, that free dance rotational into like straight line lifts um, or I'm sorry, the rotational into stationary lift is just gorgeous. They just created a lot of really beautiful shapes. There was just a that curve lift at the end. My God. Oh my gosh, it's stunning. They just really had some beautiful uh, skating skills on display. They really were emotional. I've been in the same boat where I haven't emotionally connected to those programs in a big way this season. And this is the best I have felt about them. I also don't love the Wuthering Heights music, but I thought they delivered it really well. Also, just for whatever reason, Piper was just radiant coming out oh there God, for yeah. that free dance. Uh, she just looks spectacular. She looked incredible. I mean, she always does. She has the best fashion. <laughs> <laughs> Other than Madison Chalk. I think that they are both icons in that regard. It was really lovely to see them so within themselves. I don't know how to say it without sounding woo. There was just something really beautiful about seeing them together and their sense of calm throughout the whole thing. Well, and there's sometimes where you just see a team on ice where it feels like they are dancing with and to each other and you just get to share it with them. And there's something really magical about that. And that's kind of what it felt like with Piper and Paul. Like they were inviting us to share something special with them and yeah. and in general i was just really really happy with this podium i thought that the one two three of madison shock and guinard and fabry and piper and paul that was a terrific lineup overall and um, evan bates too you said madison shock oh my gosh <laughs> but i love it it's perfect because it's maddie has all the charisma no offense to evan i mean he is the stalwart fantastic maybe the best partner on ice since guillaume retired uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> or whatever he has done he's taking a break but madison chalk has more charisma than i think i've ever seen a human have on ice i feel like that was a freudian slip on my part but regardless <laughs> <That's accurate. laughs> uh it was all wonderful and evan bates you're amazing so um <laughs> if you randomly hear this podcast uh no offense to you you're incredible in the fourth spot, then we get to Fear and Gibson. So we get the Disco Brits friendly in here. You know, they had been explosive at NHK. I love that even Mark talked about it in the commentary yes. uh, on the ISU feed about how there's been a lot of conversation about whether or not they should have won last week. What I think we saw here is a much weaker rhythm dance from them than we've seen any time earlier in the season. Easily. They just seem blatantly off. Something yeah. was wrong. The twizzles went awry. And then from that point on, they never quite seem to be able to get themselves back together. Also, there's something to be said for the fact that you have the occasional skater or team that are really, really extra fueled by crowd interaction and reaction. When you perform for Japanese audiences, you get the most expressive, loud, standing out ovations for almost everything. Just like, all the love. Huge support. And some people can grab that energy and ride that. The Beijing audience here for the Grand Prix final was a huge audience and they were wonderful, but they don't react that same way. They don't clap as long. They don't really give out the standing O's in the same way. Yeah, yeah, it's just it doesn't have quite that palpable electric energy to it like it did when they were in Japan. And I think maybe that hurt Fear and Gibson here a little bit because they do <laughs> seem to ride on that. Considering, yeah. Yeah. But they were also just one of those teams that started a little bit in the, the rhythm dance because there were just little minor mistakes, but minor mistakes add up so much in exactly. ice dance. In ice dance, everything is by inches and they lost several. The free dance, Rocky came back and was fantastic. And I did appreciate you mentioned Mark, you know, the commentator again. I appreciated that while he talked about kind of the divisive nature of their program and, you know, them winning NHK. It also was a comment that their style and what they put out is pretty much in line with what is expected from the ISU based on the new scoring system that has been in place not that long. So they are giving all the things that they're supposed to give based on the current judging system. I know that that's not everyone's cup of tea. Not everyone loves that new system. I appreciated that he was trying to give at least a counterpoint to it doesn't change how you feel about it by any means or if you even like it but at least adding some justification slash merit to it i still think 
the scoring was a little surprising with NHK. Here, I think they got a 126 in their free dance. That felt more kind of in line with what I'd expect. And they were exceptional here. If they had even been their very best in the short program, I don't know if they would have gotten past Gillis and Poirier anyway. So their overall score would have been better. I don't expect that they would have made it to third regardless. Going into the fifth position were the Canadians, uh, Laurence fournier Boudre and Nicolas Sorensen. I thought the Top Gun program was really nice, except for there were all those little breaks and problems that we saw from the first three teams. The out. Twizzles again got them. It's like the rest of the program was beautiful and incredibly well done. But I think maybe they each got level twos in their Twizzles and it was probably the messiest Twizzles I saw. Like Lila and Lewis seem to have like the most overall messy program, but Fournier Boudre and, and Sorensen felt like their twizzles were just not okay. They actually like bumped into each other. Yes, they made contact at one point, which automatically drops you a level. But they were trying to stay so close to increase their difficulty, which is something that, you know, the judges want. Yeah, they're trying to enhance the GOEs with that. It was really a bummer because I did feel like both of their programs had advanced artistically and overall as like complete programs. What I did think was weird about the Top Gun program, though, is that this whole season we've been talking about how that's the smolder program. Like, yeah where it's a really sexy program and they're really bringing the energy. That smolder wasn't there. It was a different energy. It was a little bit more smiley and out and excited. The story is all there, but the smolder just wasn't. I don't know why. Their free skate, uh, there were some problems. Like, it was definitely not their best. Uh, in particular, the, the judges really just didn't seem to like Nick very much in this one. Like, they downgraded Weirdly. several different things, and it was hard to identify exactly why. Yeah, I actually thought that, the, like, I connected to this program more here than I have previously. Yeah. I still don't think it was their best, but some of the things that they called Nick on, I was a little confused by. Again, I am not an ice dance expert, so therefore I'm sure I'm missing things. And again, it's all a matter of inches, but it did seem particularly harsh on him, which was a little surprising and definitely was going to keep them solidly in fifth place. Yeah. And then in the the sixth position, we saw the newer Canadian team of Marjorie Lajoie and Zachary. Zachary Yeah. They have the um, most fun names. Yeah, and Marjorie and Zach, we have just loved them this season. So They've much. been terrific. And earlier in the Grand Prix, in particular, their rhythm dance to Thriller has been thrilling. It has been an outstanding program. It didn't quite shine here the way that it had previously, just like we've been talking about lots of just little tiny problems where things didn't work as well as they should have. You could definitely see that coming off the ice that Zach in particular was frustrated because he normally just absolutely shines in this program. And it was just a bit diminished for whatever reason. But they came back in the free dance in just such amazing fashion. They are so gorgeous and I cannot wait to see their rise. They are still the youngest team here. They're the least experienced team here. So it makes sense that they were going to land in six, especially in ice dance where that all that matters. Your history matters in ice dance for sure. But I feel that, and I'm sure they do too, that Lolo and Nick have that Canadian team of La Joie and Lega breathing down their necks because that long program is just absolutely stunning. So technically difficult. I think that the overall dance levels are still below Lolo and Nick, but they're right there. They're really, really close. And whenever we saw them say at Cup of China earlier this season, I think they would have been ahead. So it's going to be interesting going into Canadian Nationals with the three Canadian teams that were here. I think Piper and Paul, unless they have problems, are going to easily take the gold medal. But those two other positions are going to be really hotly contested between these two teams. Yeah, we always talk about the competition within the competition. And this was certainly with three Canadian teams in this Grand Prix final. There was definitely that showdown there. Personally, I liked, especially in the free dance, I liked marjorie and zach's program better than i liked lolo and nick's agreed and i just in general seem to find that i connect with their skating a little bit more overall though it was still terrific i want to keep us moving and get into the women's competition i want to talk about queen kaori sakamoto being queen kaori sakamoto as we expected hoped and wished she would be i feel like she showed up here and got her next iteration of the coronation <laughs> yeah 
There was a thing that Mark and Ted talked about in the commentary. I'm pretty sure they were both on this one. They weren't always together on, yeah. the, on the ISU commentary. It was a set of comments that I really, really liked. Something that's really wonderful about having Kaori Sakamoto having two world championships, a bronze at the Olympics. Now she's a Grand Prix champion, which she did not manage to accomplish last season because she kind of fell apart in that competition. But we've had a long stretch in the women's discipline of having one season winners. Mm -hmm. And this is particularly because of the nature of the Russian program. While the Russians were a part of things that really you were often getting one season where somebody really stood out and then the next girl came in and then threw however many quads or whatever and advancing past her. So it was like you were seeing things like Yanni uh, Medjeva then Alina Zagitova, and then Sherbakova, and then Sasha Trusova, and then to Camille. And Kostarnaya even in there, somewhere in the middle. Right, yeah. And it was just seemed like every year you'd get somebody who'd come out and be like, oh, this is the new like champion of the sport, and they would just get replaced the next exactly. season. And so what you didn't ever get to see was this full evolution of a skater in the same way that we have seen like in the men's, when you watched Nathan Chen and Yuzuru Hanyu and Shoma Uno these people who had a chance to mature and grow and, and you had them for years and years to grow with. Yes. And you got to know them as people. You got to know their story, you get to know their style. And in the women, you just kept seeing replacement season over season. So you never felt like there was any level of permanence or a chance to get to know these people in a real way. And I wanted to know Yanni. Like yeah, she, oh my gosh. Like, oh my gosh. I loved Yanni skating. I was so like, I was so bummed when she didn't win the gold at the Olympics because I was so enamored with her skating. Uh, with no shade towards Zagitova, although I still swear that she was part of some sort of PSYOP assassin program. I think Zagitova <laughs> was actually like a black widow or something like that that was sent to assassinate diplomats in every state, every country that she went and to. And win a gold medal. <laughs> and win a gold medal because there was just something kind of dangerous about her. And Zagitova's doing fine, right? Like if you watch her Instagram or whatever, she's a total media personality and whatever now. But anyway... What we've gotten and what Mark and Ted were talking about with Cowrie is this amount of time to be able to see her develop from a person who rose kind of suddenly in the ranks, even though she'd been in on the scene for a long, long time, and then win the world, win a second world, and really settle into her role as sort of the reigning queen of women's figure skating. That's a really beautiful thing to see. It is. It's it's really important whenever you're thinking about legacy and generating interest in the sport overall. Having people that you can attach yourself to and be a fan of, not just for a year, but for long term. And while I'm sure there are plenty of fans of all of those women we mentioned that are long term fans of theirs, there's really no way to have watched them over time and felt that same longevity out of them because it wasn't allowed of them. It wasn't provided to them in terms of, you know, how the sport was going. And so to have a Kaori Sakamoto come in and settle into that role as sort of the grand dame of, of figure skating, and while also being this warm, lovely, funny personality, I think it's incredibly good for the sport overall, especially in the women's discipline where we just haven't had that in so long. And you feel it. You need the heart back in it. And I feel like Cowrie gives it that heart. Yes. She gave two expert, competent, beautiful artistic skates here. We saw a skater who has incredible skating skills. Her edge work, her lines, her flow, the fluidity and musicality of her performances you know, that double axle, which is just astounding how she takes something that's a relatively simple element and, and just makes it everything. <laughs> right. I feel like there's not much to say about Kaori's performance here other than it is exactly what you expect from Kaori Sakamoto, except for the one little thing that she did in the free skate, which was that she added in a combo element on her very last jumping pass, which is like right at the very end of the program. Because she'd missed I think it was her triple flip. She'd had a small error on. Yeah. And the competitor in her came out. We're like, I need this extra little bit. Yeah. Make up for that. Right. And so she just <laughs> threw out this combo at the very end. And like we always talk about like it's a challenging thing for skaters who have to rehearse these things over and over again to have to make changes to the jumping patterns on the fly. And you see it a little bit more in the men's than you see with the women. 
And to see her just add this piece in it, like right at the end of the program, even though, I mean, she won by like a colossal amount. She was easily ahead. But she was beating herself. She was not doing it because she thought anyone else was going to get anywhere near her. She was just doing it for herself to say like, no, I want the best score I can get. I would expect she was trying to get a season's best, which she didn't quite get. Regardless, like you said, she won by a mile and she is the class of the field. There's no question. Yeah, we've said many times before, because that's what winners do. That's what champions do. (laughs) And she is a winner. Yeah. In the second place, not a big surprise here. Maybe a little bit better, actually, than I was expecting based on earlier parts of the season. But Belgium's Luna Hendricks came in second. This has been a fairly consistent pattern over the last couple of years of having like Cowrie in first and Luna in second, depending on how well Luna performs. I think she went into this one with, you know, some struggles from her last Grand Prix appearance. And also it sounded like she was pretty ill between her last Grand Prix appearance and the final. Yeah. And maybe even had some like back issues or something. You could see in the short program that she was kind of taped up. But what we saw here from Luna was not perfect. There were certainly some scratchy jumps and a few issues and some elements that felt like they did not have the verve and energy in them that we have seen in the earlier part of the season. And I still just really don't like that ooh la la music stuff uh, (laughs) in the three dance. But I really respect how she's trying to challenge the type of choreography that we see in this sport and just the style and the way her programs are composed. And yeah, we didn't see a Luna Hendricks at the top of her game here, but we saw her strong enough to take that silver spot. And again, you can see that even if like she was struggling against illness or injury or just conditioning problems, she still has that fight and that professional attack to her skating that kept her on the podium. Oh, yeah. I mean, she has so much elegance with fire. It's wonderful whenever it's at full power. But here she was at maybe 80 percent, which is still better than most. It was still really fun to see her come out and skate well enough to get the silver here. I think it's good for her confidence going into the second half of the season, particularly her short program felt a lot more like Luna than we had seen at Cup of China. So it was it was nice to see her closer to her normal form. I think the third place finisher was a bit of a surprise. This is really interesting. So going through this, uh, for one thing, there were three Japanese women in this final and your most seasoned one is obviously Kaori. Um, And then you had these two kind of upstarts with Hana Yoshida and Rian Samiyoshi. We had actually kind of expected, I think your predictions here was that you expect Ryan on the podium, right? Your expectation had been, I think, Kaori, Isabeau, uh, Rian. Rian. Yep. I had not placed either of these young women on my podium prediction. And I'm kind of kicking myself because Hana Yoshida has been on such a come up this season. Every time we see her, she's just delivering a little bit better She came into this looking a little bit nervous. She's so identifiable by the joy that she brings to the ice, not just in performances, but just how she takes the ice. She tends to show up on the ice with this smile and lightness to her when so many other people look either stoic or nervous. And this was kind of the first time I think I've seen Hana Yoshida look a little nervous going on the ice. But she did a really, really nice job here. She was in the fourth after the short program and made her way onto the podium Uh, with a really, really strong free skate. Yeah, a really exceptional free skate. Her short program, I I just prefer overall. Like, I think it was uh, choreographed by Caitlin Weaver. It's got a vibe, if you will. Yeah. It's very different than most of the women, and that's why I really like it. But it, she just didn't have the overall firepower that she usually does. So the short program was definitely rough for her. But in that free program, she showed up. She quarter turn under rotated, but still landed her triple axel. And that set her off on a great trajectory for the rest of the program. And I really love Hana Yoshida. I'm excited to see where she's going to go. She's still really young. I like that she has that fight in her where instead of falling apart after a rough short, she came out fighting. It was really lovely. And I'm happy that she got the bronze. Definitely. Yeah, I'm looking forward to a, a long and exciting career from her. I think that she's somebody that as she matures as a skater, And in particularly when you look at like a Kaori Sakamoto, who I think is about 23, you can see that there is time to really grow and develop here. And Hana is uh, is definitely one to watch for sure. In the fourth place, another skater who has really overperformed this season so far 
This was the second Belgium uh, in this lineup. And this is the first time that Belgium's ever had like two skaters in the same discipline at the Grand Prix final. So um, it was really exciting for them. Uh, Nina Pizzarone has been a real surprise this season. She's come on really strong. We saw her on the podium in that really surprise uh, podium a few weeks ago that had uh, Eva Marie Ziegler and Lindsay Thorngren on it. And she had performed really well earlier at a previous Grand Prix. She wasn't as strong in her free skate here, uh, at least by way of comparison to what like Hana Yoshida delivered. But still, like this is a very musical skater. There's a lot of maturity considering that she's essentially fresh out of juniors. Again, I just think this is somebody to really keep your eye on because I think that she's a really, really compelling skater. She definitely has a ton of the promise written all over her, if you will. She is somebody who I expect to be in the mix for the next several years, maybe into the next Olympic cycle beyond just this one into Milano Cortina. It feels like she has all of the pieces. It's just putting them together and getting just a little more strength overall. Like, and I mean that in like kind of the power sense, not in the composition. I feel like she is showing the markers of a champion. She just needs time. But man, did she show up and she's been so consistent. That alone in the women's discipline is almost as exciting as a grand program. You came and you did your job, yeah. even as nervous as she was and as tight as you could kind of feel like she was because she had some under rotations. Sure. But that's expected. This is her first Grand Prix final. This is unexpected to even be here. So the fact that she came in fourth, bravo to you. I think that's something that people who are new to this sport don't necessarily quite understand at first, because a lot of sports have that mentality of like second place is the first loser. Yeah. And they don't get that working your way up the podium and, and developing over time is a really important thing in this sport. And don't recognize that for a skater coming in as young as she is and so new into the senior circuit to have landed even just off the podium. I'm sure she obviously she would have loved to have been of on the course. podium. But fourth place is still a very respectable spot for her to land in here. It is not nothing. Yeah. It is highly respectable. The, the flip side of that is when you have somebody that you really expected to be on the podium, to be a real threat for one of those medals and have a really, really rough short program and then a redemptive free skate. But that's Isabeau Levito from the United States. We both had Isabeau picked for our podiums. I think uh, we both had her in silver position. Yes. Yeah, that was absolutely where I expected her to land. Isabeau is so typically a consistent skater. Like you just feel like you can always count on her to deliver. But we did note that when she did win her first Grand Prix medal, it did not come the way she would have wanted to. No. And there has been long, long bits of conjecture about her approach on her, particularly her toe jumps, the Lutz and the flip that it could potentially long-term cause physical damage and, and not be sustainable and in terms of its technique. Frankly, I don't know enough about the technique to speak to that specifically, but I can say that whenever we were watching her at the last Grand Prix, every jump had this kind of strained, like she was muscling it up, if you will. And her short program here had that same push and muscling something up, not anything we've really seen from Isabeau before. So I don't know if it was injury. I don't know if it was self-doubt or if it was just exhaustion, but it was definitely and very obviously stunning to her as well. Like she is just that consistent, constant skater, which in the women's discipline, like I was saying about Nina Pizzarone, that's a gift. Whenever you are that stalwart competitor that is always there, it makes you a constant threat. And to see her struggle to the degree that she did here I mean, it was heartbreaking. I felt so bad. Yeah, I don't want to be like dwelling on the negative here, but I do think it's worth looking at a couple of things that happened in her short program. And like I said, like she comes back super strong. She looked great in her free skate. Her free skate. So maybe yeah. this is all conjecture that doesn't need to be said. Yeah, but in the short program, she was supposed to have a, a triple Lutz and uh, she doubled it, which then has no value. So like immediately that starts off the program in a rough way. She did her double axel with this incredibly low dip where you can see her go so far into her knee in order to get popped up into that jump. And it just looked awkward and painful and like she was fighting her way through it. And then she had a messy combo that was like a triple flip double toe. She just didn't look like herself and she had been confident in the warm up. But when she took the ice, she already looked nervous like she yeah. wasn't sure what was going on. What with herself. was even the difference in her illusion? 
her illusions are my favorite of anybody. And she didn't do them in the short. Like there's one spin where she has them as part of it and you could see her just kind of check out of it and, and just keep going with everything else. And I don't know that she got a deduction for it, but it regardless, it was just that like, this is Isabeau's thing. This is one of the things that she's known to do and better than anybody else. And it's all those death by a thousand cuts moments where yeah. you're seeing it. And it's like, I just saw a different skater out there in the short program. To your point, though, in the free program, all of her fight and grit and the Isabeau we expect to see came back in spades. So this really might be more mental than physical, but it's something I really hope that she can come to terms with and get past because it was definitely not the competition I'm sure she expected or or desired to have. And it going into the rest of her season, I hope it's one she can just forget. Yeah, her free skate was was everything that you expect from Isabel. It was very, very strong. Also, she got a new outfit, which is way better. Um, well, she said the first one was was beautiful, but really uncomfortable and yeah. not meant for skating. <laughs> right. Yes. I I also thought it was just kind of an ugly outfit. And I thought the uh, the new one is it works better. But regardless, I mean, that's just an aesthetic choice. But um, it was really great to see her bring it back. And also just a shout out to the Chinese audience that gave her just an enormous amount of support after that really bad short program. They and you could really see how beautiful. they lift her up. Yeah, they were really beautiful to her. And I saw a comment from her where she thanked the Chinese audience for the toys because it cheered her up and I almost cried. It's so heartwarming and good to see. And I, it's one of the things I love most about this sport is the audience, the overall moral support that they want to provide to the athletes that they care about. It's really beautiful and it's a rarity. I'm grateful for it for her. In the sixth position, Japan's Rion Sumiyoshi definitely didn't land where we were expecting from her. She is more of a technician skater than she is an artistic skater. And so, you know, she really does have to rely on big jumps. She does have a quad. She has a quad toe. And that's a big part of her arsenal to be able to land herself on podiums and grab numbers. She isn't competing in that PCS score in the same way. She's not as refined of an artist. And she just had some struggles here. There were just some things that didn't work very well. And the thing was, is that she had some very good jumps in here, too, and some good combos. I particularly really like her free skate. I like that program a lot on her. Overall, she's a very promising skater. And I think that she's definitely, again, in that one to watch category as things go along. I just think this just wasn't her weekend. Yeah. I mean, it's as simple as that. Nothing about her performances were particularly concerning. I just felt like she was off, probably nervous being in her first Grand Prix final. It was not the skates I expected from her, but she is a a star of the future, which just wasn't her day. Yeah, agreed. Well, why don't we why don't we wrap things up with the pairs then? I know we've gone pretty deep on all of this. The Paris competition was the one where we really thought we were certain about who was going to go home with gold. This was definitely the most surprising of all the podiums. Wow, I'll say that. we did not expect quite no. how that went. And not at all. The surprise win here is from the German team Minerva, Fabienne, Haas, and Nikita Veloden. And honestly, we should have. We should have known. We should have known. Kidding. They've been on such a roll. And this is a team that they've won their three straight competitions, like just back to back to back. And they've done it with adverse conditions. Like they've had consistent problems with their gear. They've had sickness. Nikita was ill going into this. And they hadn't done a free program run through since NHK at all until they got here. Yeah, they literally physically weren't able to get all the way through (gasps) their free program for two weeks going into this and then did it essentially for the first time on the ice in performance and won the damn competition with it. The expression on Minerva's face whenever she sees that they won it is priceless. It's memeable. I mean, her eyes just bug out of her head. It's amazing. And they deserved it. They absolutely deserved it. Their short program in particular was just exceptional. Their free program was a little bit slower and definitely you could feel how rough a time he was having. Everything was still very good, but by the end of it, it's like you could see the physical pain he was in from having had to do that program. The poor guy. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I want to throw in there that it's amazing to me that Nikita was ill and struggling through this because I thought in their short program, I think that's the best I've ever seen him. And I say yeah, that of this season watching them as a team, but he really shined in that short program and they've really just brought it all together. 
in a season where we've really been worried about getting excited about pairs, especially when we've had teams like Riku and Ryuchi who have not been in it because they've been out for injury and stuff, it's been kind of a building year. Like it's a lot of groups that are trying to like figure out how to become competitive. Haas and Veloden came out of nowhere and have really made a statement that they are challengers in this whole discipline right now. And with a gold medal in the Grand Prix final, in a competition that had a very clear favorite and another team that that also podiumed at Worlds last year, Haas and Veloden we were, were not the team I don't think anybody was going to pick for the podium here. But their performance, their consistency, what they laid down here, and then when also you look at some of uh, the challenges that the Canadians faced in this skate... Haas and Veloden just took it and they deserved it. Yeah. I mean, at the beginning of the season, I agree. No one would have expected it. But by NHK, I feel like we should have known because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> their momentum was so good. But I'm really impressed with this team. But I was also really impressed with Conti and Machi from Italy coming in from not a great season so far, really looking rather rough and and kind of unorganized in, in their overall presentation. And they came in strong here. and. I mean, this competition was pretty tight. They were not that far behind Hassan Veloden in second place. Yeah. You know, this whole season, we've been talking about how like they had really come through at the end of last year. They had gotten on the podium at Worlds. They had kept their long program, which we didn't really care for. And they have just not felt like they were able to put all the pieces together early in this season. They're terrific skaters. They're beautiful artistically. They're such a great team, but they weren't exciting at all this year. And then here at the final, we saw them kind of finally put those pieces together. They looked more confident. They looked more connected. They looked more relaxed on the ice. Agreed. And And it really, really helped them to deliver two very strong programs. Yeah. She even made the comment that our season starts here after the short program. And I totally agree with that. Forget everything that came before. This is a great place to start. Yeah, it's just the best that we've seen them. And I was really taken with those skates. The thing that is the bummer of all of this positive stuff is that it means that our favorites and the favorites to win here, Deanna Stiletto, Dudek, and Maxime Deschamps, came in third. And it's understandable. They had a rough short program. Their long program was tight by comparison to other iterations of it that we've seen. It was still fantastic. Their quality level of what they do overall as a team is the reason that they were the favorites coming in here. But overall, they just had enough problems here and there, especially in the free program, the side by side jumps that Deanna missed, singled her axle, things like that. Like they weren't huge mistakes, but there was just enough of them where it kind of brought them down lower and lower. And again, they weren't that far behind Haas and Veloden. Those th- top three teams were pretty, you know, close together in terms of their scoring. And I appreciated seeing Deanna mention after the the competition that she was proud of them for getting as high of a score as they did with the problems they had in both programs, because it basically tells them that the ceiling is higher overall if they are at their best in terms of what they could get as a score. So it's still a positive in a lot of ways. It's just, I'm sure, not where they wanted to be on the podium. Yeah, clean skates would have won this for them, without question. Yes. So when you look at the top three here, Haas and Veloden, 206.43 total, Conti and Machi, 205.88, and then Stilato Dudek and Deschamps with uh, 204.30. So in, in this like two-point spread between those top three. So this was a very, very tight race. You know, with Deanna and Max, we absolutely adore them as skaters. We've loved their program so far this season. And I think that what we saw with their short program, it's a little bit more evolution. It looked a little bit more sophisticated in its choreography. I think they're continuing to develop these programs. But yeah, there's just a few of those technical elements. Just, you know, it's the death by a thousand cuts thing again, where you're just taking a few little hits, um, but it's just enough to whittle you down. And when you're all as tight as this, it's what puts you into a, a bronze rather than at the top of the podium like expected. So that was a big surprise for us. And I think kind of most everybody else. Yeah, for sure. But sometimes people will say like, it's yours to lose when you're in that kind of position. And in this particular instance, I think to a degree, a clean skate from them would have won and they weren't clean. So they didn't win. Yeah, that's very fair. It was exciting to see the Hungarian team in fourth whenever they were the ones who had been subbed in for Hawk and Kunkel, who had to re- withdraw due to injury. 
I think I even said in the preview episode that I didn't find them super memorable. They didn't stand out to me. So I, I couldn't even think about much to say about them going into it. But they were really refreshing. They were surprisingly strong out there. Their throne triple twist was beautiful. They've got the weird, bad Euro version of another one bites the dust at the start of their oh. program that I don't like. Still, it was a strong program and they were fun to watch. I think that we saw them have uh, a little bit of errors in their their free skate, which, um, you know, kind of brought them down a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it was a bummer that they had that because it felt like they were on their way to the perfect skate, you know, which is everyone's dream in this kind of circumstance at this type of competition. And they were so close. Yeah. But still, I think showing up at this as the alternates and getting into the fourth place spot is a big deal. And I think that looks really good for them going forward in the season. Yeah. I mean, cheers to Pablo Van Sviavchenko for that. And fifth, Gilardi and Ambrosini from Italy. I have been more impressed with them previous in the season, but I still feel, particularly in their free skate, that they showed up really well. I love their musical choice here because they use the good, bad and the ugly soundtrack and then also like sort of a Metallica piece from that. In their short. Uh, yeah, that's uh, fun. In, in and the then short. their long is another vampire theme. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, they do Dracula. I had actually in my picks, I had uh, this Italian team on the podium. I was expecting them to kind of pop up a little higher in this one because they had been performing so well earlier in the season. I don't know why I just had a good vibe about it. That's not how it came out here. I just think that they weren't as strong and as confident as uh, I was expecting out there. They're still very enjoyable to watch. It was just a little bit more of an okay performance compared to what we saw earlier on. The ones I had on the podium who didn't make it on my side were Leah Pereira and Trent Mashaw. I was bummed to see their short program in particular here with Leah having a fall on the throw and they're a great, great team and they have made a huge impact in a relatively short period of time. So no shade to them in any fashion. But having seen what they can do earlier in the season, I kind of expected better performances here. Their long was really nice. They had a good free skate, which was a nice bit of redemption for them. But overall, sixth place was not quite where I expected them to land. And I doubt it was where they thought they would either. Sometimes it just doesn't work out, you know, exactly. like it, it just doesn't it doesn't happen. But uh, one way or another, this was still a really exciting competition. Um, Overall, I, completely. Like I said earlier, like I've been so worried about pairs as a discipline this season, seeing these teams here and particularly just with the rise of Haas and Veloden, I just think it's really promising for this discipline. And I think it helps it a ton. And I had a really good time with a lot of these programs. I did, too. And that's that's to be said for everything we saw this weekend. I mean, I think it was an exceptional weekend of skating overall at the final. In a lot of ways, it's good to have some surprises because it keeps you wanting to come back and yeah. be like, oh, wait, this is not how I thought this was going to go. Sometimes I think it's challenging for people if they get into like ice dance when it seems like the the outcomes are predetermined and people just fall right in line with where you predicted. I think it's really boring upsets and change of weather and people rising to the top while other ones falter like that's what makes sport exciting it does and uh there's definitely some things we would have never predicted that would have happened at this event but that's what makes them memorable it was a memorable competition overall yeah i'm not gonna soon forget some of the stuff i saw here so i'm i'm excited and it makes me that much more excited to keep watching as the second half of the season comes up especially knowing that some of these teams you've seen and in, in individuals You've seen already grow so much in the first half of the season. I can't wait to see what they come back with at their individual nationals and let alone worlds. Yeah. So we have a new feature in our show now. Ooh la la, I forgot about it. Yes. Um, see, I, like, I, it, I brought it back to ooh la la. Ooh la la. <laughs> so this new thing that we're doing is called, and it's super cheesy, gold in our hearts. I really want to have like a ding, ding, ding. Right. Like, like, <laughs> like uh, you, you're not seeing me wave my hands in the air like it's the more you know or like yes. reading rainbow or something, but like gold in our hearts, which is essentially just like a performance or performer that really touched our hearts in it, uh, that really made us happy, but did not land on the podium. And I'm curious, what was gold in your heart? Isabel uh, Levito in her free program, seeing her come back strong and really show up for herself, not for the medal, not for the podium in any fashion, just to show up for herself and just to see the joy on her face at the end of that program is absolutely gold in my heart. Nice. This is a tough call from this one, but I think I'm going to go with Marjorie and Zach. Uh, oh. The Canadian Ice Dance team, even though they landed in sixth in Ice Dance, their free dance, I just loved it. I was so invested in it, so just pulled in by what they were doing. 
And I've loved them so much this season that they get my complimentary gold medal. Can I give one more extra gold medal out, but it's not somebody that was a Grand Prix final, but did compete this weekend? It's an Easter egg. Yeah. The golden spin competition happened this weekend at the same time for a lot of the other teams and skaters that did not make the Grand Prix final. And I don't think you're aware that the ice dance competition was won by Reed and Amber Lavicius. Yeah. And in that competition, they broke 200 points. So, haha, good job, them. Yes, that's so they amazing. They're also gold in my heart and gold on another podium. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I had them uh, as the gold in my heart in last week, in last week because that <laughs> Lithuanian team is wonderful. I love their storytelling. I love their vibe. I'm really into that team. That's really exciting. I thought you'd like that call. I'm really into that. <laughs> yes. Thank you for giving that to me. That was a nice little present and a surprise <laughs> element at the end of our episode. <laughs> So we've gone on quite a while about all of this. And uh, if you've stuck with us to the end, thank you so much for joining us here with Scoriography. <laughs> um, if you are listening to this episode on a platform where you can leave comments and communicate with us, tell us your favorite skates. Tell us the biggest surprises to you, Who's the biggest gold upset. In your heart? Who is gold in your heart? <laughs> Let us know that because we love to hear that part too. Uh, we just love any of your feedback. Um, if we've made some mistakes, fact check us. We always appreciate that. Um, and just let us know, like, you know, what you are enjoying about the show. What else you'd like to hear us talk about as we go forward through the season. The Scoreography is available at Scoreography.show. That's our website where all of our stuff is at. Um, you can listen to us on YouTube and on all the podcasting platforms. So Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Uh, it's probably also on the Audible and Amazon all platforms. Place. All of the places. We're in most of the social media places as well. We're most active on Instagram. We are at Scoreography there. We're on Threads is at Scoreography. We're on Twitter for the moment is at Scoreography. And we're on Blue Sky is at Scoreography.show. But Instagram is definitely kind of the hub um, but again, if there's other places where you'd like to see us, um, where, where you feel like skating lives in social media, let us know in the comments. Through the end of the, of the year, the rest of the stuff that's coming up is more like the national competitions and Europeans. So what are we looking forward to? We're looking forward to Japanese nationals uh, in just a couple of weeks over the Christmas holiday. Europeans in January, the very beginning of January. I believe Canadians are the same weekend as Europeans. And then not too far after that is U.S. Nationals and then four continents. So there's a lot coming up. So, yeah, so we've we've hit the halfway point of the season, the big international competition that defines the first half. But anything can happen as we go on from here. So it's going to be really interesting to see what we can watch, uh, what <laughs> yeah, we can get our that's true, what we are able to find that will be available, whether it's the ISU feed. Is this where the Nord VPN ad would be inserted if <laughs> Nord VPN was our sponsor right right yeah get yourself a vpn so that you can actually watch some of the skating on on youtube and other places so uh <laughs> yeah exactly because that's the way we'll have to watch some of it anything that isn't actually coming through um peacock which is where we've been watching most of this stuff but um stick with us because we're going to be talking about the second half of the season some of these other competitions and uh everything. and more and more so we're gonna have more so, dot 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 it's, not, it's, it's coming <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah with that um we're gonna wrap up our grand prix uh final 2023 recap episode thanks for sticking with us and for choreography i'm adrian busky and i'm wendy busky and we'll talk to you next time bye